and welcome to Sims Racing. As you might have guessed from the title of this video, we'll be visiting the Spanish tarmac stages in Dirt Rally 2.0. I know that many players feel comfortable and are quick on gravel and snow, but struggle on the tarmac stages, especially those in Spain. At least, that's what I've been told. Luckily for you, Spanish tarmac is where I excel at. It was on this surface that I qualified for the quarterfinals of the Dirt Rally World Series several months ago and eventually was able to reach the semi-finals as well. So what I'll do is try and help you guys improve those times on the smooth stages in Spain. But before we get into any specifics, I'll give you a quick overview, a rundown of what I'll be discussing. Number one is overall tips and tricks on how to improve stage times in general. Then I'll quickly touch on a few things when it comes to setups. And finally, I'll be talking about techniques for braking, cornering, etc. Focusing specifically on Spain. So, let's jump into our first topic, which is overall tips and tricks for improving stage times, starting off with the way you should approach a practice session. Selecting a stage and sticking with it is a good idea, as jumping between different stages actually slows down your progress significantly. Going at it like a wrecking ball at full speed from the moment Phil says go, won't work in your favour either. You'll be going off and having intimate moments with the scenery far too often. This will quickly lead to frustration which is counterproductive and definitely not what we need. Start your session by doing a few runs at a slower pace, getting familiar with the car and the stage. Once you feel comfortable you can pick up that pace a bit more by trying to brake later or carry more speed into corners. And once you are putting in consistent stage times, you can then try again and push just that bit more. If increasing your pace through a whole stage is difficult, select one or multiple sections of the stage instead. You can for example just practice the first split over and over and once you are comfortable with the pace add the second split to your runs. At a certain point during your practice you will discover either your limits or those of the car. If you reach your limits first you will have to try and push them further. What we eventually want to achieve is to push our limits to the point that they are equal to those of the car. Trying to push your limits will result in more crashes but don't let that affect you. You have to keep in mind luckily for us this isn't real life but a game and we have do-overs. Reaching the limits of the car won't be an easy task and takes a fair amount of time to achieve. None of the top drivers are where they are from doing just a few fun runs here and there. All of them have put in countless hours in order to join the players at the very top. I personally spend a week practicing 6 hours a day on average in order to be competitive in the quarterfinals. Now, once you're at that point where you've found that fine line and can comfortably push the car to its limits, you'll have to try and keep it there. Consistency is key. You can try to push the car over its limits, but that usually ends in you flying off a cliff or smashing into a rock. With the way you approach your practice session sorted out, let's talk about another aspect, which is focus. It's extremely important that you can direct your full attention to the task at hand. To help you do that, I suggest that you remove all possible distractions. And to be absolutely clear, kicking your wife, kids and pets out of the house is not what I'm referring to. What I mean by this is that you remove any and all distractions from your screen, such as the progress bar, split times, HUD or head up display and so on. Seeing a red section appear on your progress bar or a split time in the middle of your screen will definitely have an effect on your performance. The moment it pops up it will draw your attention away from the road ahead which is something we don't want. It might also result in you pushing harder in order to try to catch up and in almost all cases you will push too hard and eventually give that beautiful tree you love so much a big old hug. This applies to the HUD or head up display as well. More often than not sim racers are focusing too much on selecting the right gear for a corner. Glancing at the gear you're in, even for a fraction of a second, draws your attention away from the road or corner. By the time your focus is fully on the road again, you might have already passed the point of turning, losing you time. I always focus on the revs of the car, I know more or less how far the revs will rise if I change down the gear. I do have to admit that it takes a bit of getting used to. When discussing the aspect of focus we also have to mention ghosts. Sure, you can select ghosts of other drivers, but don't make them appear on the stage itself. More often than not, they obstruct the view ahead and are a major distraction. When you select a ghost without letting it appear on the stage, you will still be able to compare your splits and times with theirs after the finish. Also, don't just select the ghosts of the top drivers right away. Select ghosts of a few drivers that are a handful of seconds quicker than you and focus on where you lose time compared to them. As you climb the leaderboards you can select ghosts of faster drivers. And finally a small element I do want to touch on within overall tips and tricks has to do with your gear. More specifically your wheel. 
try adjusting your wheel rotation to a point that allows you to be as precise as possible. For me personally, that's at 540 degrees. If I set it higher, I'm wrestling with the wheel too much. Setting it lower makes the car move direction too quickly and less controllable. Our next major topic is setups. However, I won't go into this for too long. What I do want to mention is that having a good setup will indeed improve your performance. But, you need to be careful with using setups from other people. Each driver has his own driving style which affects the way the driver sets up his car. He might go faster with it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you will. If you do want to change your setup, then I suggest you start with the easiest things to adjust and get right, which are brake balance, brake pressure and gearing. Now let's get into the real business and discuss techniques, tips and tricks for Spain in particular. In order to do that, I'll begin by analyzing onboard, bonnet and chase cam footage of a run I did yesterday on the Descenso por Carretera stage. It wasn't my fastest or cleanest run, but I did set a 2 minute 7.209 seconds, which is roughly 3 seconds slower than Lucas Bateja. This year is the Rally World Series champion, so I can't complain about it too much after not having competed at any level since the Dirt Rally World Series semi-finals last December. As you can see, I do have a timer and head-up display enabled. Normally I don't have any of those features on my screen, but for this video I enabled them as it will help me with visualizing my explanation. First off, I'll be talking about driving style. Each type of surface or event requires a rally driver to adjust their driving style somewhat in order to be quick. When it comes to the Spanish stages, we'll have to adopt a driving style that is used by circuit racing drivers. This means we'll have to make sure the car grips to the tarmac as much as possible while using all the available road and sometimes more. That's something I'll touch on later. I know that this all sounds rather fake, but delving deeper into the braking and cornering techniques in just a bit, things will become clearer and make more sense. With that out of the way, let's turn our attention to braking. And we'll start off with when to apply the brakes. For this, we'll be looking at those circuit racing drivers once again. When approaching a corner, they are looking for a braking point, whether it's a distance marker, a specific curbstone or something else. We'll be applying the same technique here in Spain. Let's have a look at some footage. We are just going flat out through the most difficult part of the stage. And as you can see in the bottom left, I keep my foot down through the first section the whole way. When I reach the next corner, I'll do a quick tap on the brakes, but not lift off the throttle completely in order to try and not unsettle the car. Then we are screaming down the straight in fifth gear close to the top speed of the car. At this point we need to start watching out for that braking point, which for this corner is the beginning of the roadside barrier on the left. When we eventually reach this point, it's very important that the car is as stable as possible the moment we slam on those brakes. The reason why is because we need to be able to brake as efficiently and as late as we can. When we hit the brakes, all the weight of the car is being transferred to the front. And in order to brake most efficiently, we need the car to be perfectly balanced the moment that weight starts shifting. So once we apply the brakes, we need to make sure that we are braking in a straight line. That way all the car has to do is focus on slowing itself down. If we turn the wheel of the car before or while braking heavily, the front wheel suddenly have to deal with two things at once. And at the same time, because we are not moving in a straight line, the weight isn't being transferred equally over the front, making the car become unsettled. First, this will result in less efficient braking and an increased braking distance. And secondly, the car is more difficult or less predictable to control going into a corner. Depending on how the car is set up, it will either understeer, pushing the nose wide, or oversteer, meaning the rear steps out of line and you start sliding, or worse, spin out. So to recap, make sure you are braking in a straight line, especially when it comes to heavy braking, as this shortens the braking distance and keeps the car nicely balanced. Our next step is of course cornering. Obviously what we need to do is find the quickest line through a corner or a combination of multiple corners. For a single corner we'll apply the same technique used by circuit racing drivers. We place our car all the way to the outside, then turn in, trying to hit that apex and using all the available road when exiting. For a combination of multiple corners, your approach will differ depending on the types of corners following the initial one. So let's have another look at our footage, rewinding it to the point of turning. At this moment, it's very important to not instantly and completely lift off the brake. The reason for it, again, comes down to weight transfer. When releasing the brake, the weight is shifting backwards, raising up the nose of the car. Lifting off too quickly will make the weight transfer happen too abruptly, popping up the nose too fast. That results in the front of the car starting to lose too much grip, which creates understeer when turning in. This effect increases even more significantly if you lift off the brakes instantly and push that throttle to the floor, as the weight shifts even further to the back, pushing the rear down and the nose up even more. 
and in a situation where you lift off the brake, go on the throttle, but then brake again as you realize you are still carrying too much speed, well, that usually ends with you losing quite a lot of time through that corner. So what we need to do is to make sure that the weight transfer happens gradually rather than instantly. The best way to do that is to slowly start releasing the brake before the initial turning. This will keep just enough weight on the front wheels giving them sufficient grip for turning. Once we are well on the inside of the corner we can start applying the throttle and completely releasing the brake. This technique is known as trail braking. After hitting that apex we can accelerate out of the corner going as wide as possible and using all the available road. However in this footage we have multiple corners following this one so I don't go wide too much but stay in the middle of the road in order to be able to go through the next one as fast as possible. Next up is a technique specifically for rallying which is corner cutting. And I don't mean cuts like these. People setting top times on the leaderboards while using them deserve to be banned instantly in my honest opinion. Practices like these go against every fiber in my body and it's a shameful and disgusting act. Short rant aside, what I'm referring to is the real art of corner cutting, where you cut the inside of the corner and staying with at least two wheels on the tarmac at all times. And for that I'll pick footage from one of my runs on Salida de Simon Ver. We are roughly mid-stage coming up to a rather deceptible 3 left followed by a sweeping right-hander. And it's this right-hander here we'll have a look at. What we could do is stay on the road with all 4 wheels but that will lose us a tiny bit of time as we won't be able to carry the same amount of speed through the corner as we would when cutting it. What we need to do is go a bit deeper into the corner going off the road with half the width of the car. The moment we begin cutting the corner the car starts to tilt downwards on the right side. This means that forces will now push our car against the edge of that corner preventing us from going wide to the left. And that results in of course us being able to carry a lot more speed through the corner. The thing that always pops into my mind when trying to compare it to something else is watching a bobsleigh team take a corner while going down the course. The same forces and effects are created. Now there are lots of different types of corners you can cut but I did want to show you this one as it's the type that will benefit you most of all. And I'll just mention this once more, cutting a corner by going off the road with four wheels is cheating. It's actually categorized as an illegal cut in the top competitions such as the Rally World Series and the John Armstrong Thrustmaster E-Rally Series. If they catch you doing it, you will be disqualified. To round off this video I'll be discussing the technique for a special type of corner. That type of corner where we need to use the one thing we as rally drivers love so much and are probably using it way more often than we actually should. Yes, I'm talking about the handbrake turn and the handbrake, or what Jeremy, Richard and James from the Grand Tour call the love handle. Everybody knows that feeling when there's a hairpin coming up and we can finally yank that thing to throw the car around. Whether it's for the first time you do it or the millionth time, it always feels so satisfying when executing it perfectly. Doing that, however, isn't always as simple as many believe. Take for example the Descenso por Carretera stage we looked at when talking about braking and cornering. I bet a lot of you use it at least once, if not multiple times. And I know many won't like this, but to be honest, there's not a single corner on that stage where yanking the handbrake or the love handle is the most efficient way of going around it. And I hate to burst your love handle bubble even more, but in Spain there's actually only just one corner where using it is justified. I know and I'm sorry, but if you want to go as quickly as you can, you'll have to face and accept that reality. But always remember that you can pull that thing and chuck the car around as much as you can during fun runs, of course. So to illustrate this, I'll use footage from the Ascenso Por Valle El Gualet stage. It's a corner we all know very well and where many of us drivers will use the handbrake. First I'll show the footage of this corner using the handbrake and after that we'll see footage of going around the same corner without the use of the handbrake. Each clip starts at the moment we reach the barrier and stops once the barrier ends. And to show the difference I've put a timer at the top of the screen. Let's roll clip number one. As you can see it took us 5.354 seconds. Now let's check out clip number two. Without using the handbrake it only took us 5.104 seconds, which is roughly 2 tenths of a second quicker, and that's just in a single corner. So you can start to imagine that once you reach the finish, you might have just lost yourself several seconds because of pulling the handbrake. It's not only using it too often that loses you time, yanking it for too long also has the same effect. Yes, by pulling the handbrake the car is able to rotate a lot quicker, but the more aggressive you pull it, the more sideways momentum will be generated. Ergo, more sideways momentum equals less forward momentum. 
Now that's not exactly what we need. It looks cooler, but isn't quicker. So what we want to achieve is to keep most of our forward momentum going by trying to limit the amount of sideways momentum. In other words, once the car stops rotating, the direction of the nose should line up nicely with the stretch of road ahead. The moment you need to correct by counter steering, you are losing time. To show you what I mean, I have a few more clips for you showing the only proper handbrake corner in Spain. Both clips start and end at the same point with a timer at the top to show you the difference. We'll check out the footage of being a bit too aggressive first, followed by the footage of the smooth handbrake turn. Let's roll tape number one. And our time is 7.404 seconds. Let's see what that looked like from a different angle. As you can see the car is rotating way too much and we have to correct it by counter steering. Let's roll tape number 2. The time we've set now is 7.104 seconds, which is exactly 3 tenths of a second quicker. If we look at the chase cam footage we can see it's quite a bit smoother and our nose points in the right direction, giving us enough traction to quickly pull out of the corner. The only question that still remains to be answered now is how do you do a proper handbrake turn? For that we'll check out the same footage but from a sideways angle. When braking heavily for a hairpin, what you'll need to do first is to gradually begin lifting off the brake pedal. The reason why is because we need to start turning in order to get that initial car rotation going. If we pull the handbrake before turning in, the wheels just lock up and you'll be heading straight towards the spectators, which is not a good idea. So it's when we got that initial car rotation going that we will pull the handbrake. Again, not for too long, but just enough to get the back end to swing around. This moment here is where many players make a critical mistake. What they'll do is floor the throttle the moment they release the handbrake. The problem is that heavy throttle input, while still being in full swing mode, will not make you go forward but instead will increase your sideways momentum and rotation. Instead of immediately flooring it, just wait a click until the car starts to settle again and points its nose in the right direction. That's the moment the car will have more or less optimal traction to pull out of the corner quickly. From the bonnet footage you can also see that the second the car settles and points the right way I push the throttle completely down. So there we are, a whole bunch of techniques, tips and tricks for you to try out on those Spanish tarmac stages. And to give you a final piece of advice, don't try to do them all at once, but practice and master one technique at a time. I know there was quite a bit of technical stuff in there, but I sincerely hope this will help many of you out, and you will be able to set stage times that are several seconds quicker. The only thing for me to do now is to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and learned a thing or two, please smash that like button. If you want to see more of our content in the future, clicking that subscribe button and hitting the notification bell is a good idea. Thank you for watching, goodbye.